gentlemen, welcome to Colette, a one-woman show, the author of Gigi in her own words. This is a work in progress. We value your reactions and responses, which will help us in our work of refining the show. We hope you will enjoy this evening's performance. Bonsoir. I have been writing for many decades now, and for many decades, the material worries of life, or fixed deadlines, have set the pace for my work and my existence. Now, age and uh, infirmity have banished all possibilities of romantic encounters, quelle tristesse, from now on, all that I possess is what unfolds on the screen of my window, just uh, lightning from the heavens or uh, from an eye, the constellations and everything that expands under my magnifying glass. No. <laughs> oh, but by the grace of God, I am still accumulating leaves of books even though they may never be published or even finished. I've already published dozens of books of fiction, so now might be the right time to unburden myself of my own story. Hmm? Mm -hmm. The hour has come for me to give myself over to reveries about my life. But be warned, my horoscope threatens me with longevity. Well, if I am going to tell you about my life, let's clear one thing up from the start. My name is not Colette. Well, it was not Colette when I was born. Oh, no, it was, but that was my last name. My name at birth was Sidonie Gabrielle Colette. How I came to be known by only my last name is a strange story. Should I tell you? Maybe later, if you behave. I was the last of my mother's four children. She was in labor three days with me. My mother carried high when she was pregnant with me. Near her heart, she always said. That's why I didn't want to come down. <laughs> and near her heart was where I stayed for her whole life. Even after I left that sleepy little town of... Uh, saint sauvin de Puiseille, where I was born and where I spent the first 20 years of my life. You know the saying that behind every great man is a great woman? Well, behind almost every great woman is a great mother. <laughs> I know that it was a privilege to have had a mother like mine. Sido, that was my mother's name. She was the best, the most independent spirit I have known. In the village where she lived out the end of her life, <laughs> several women of her age invited my mother to attend these gatherings where they would uh, knitting for the poor and they discussed issues of local importance and philanthropy. She tried it out and she came back all flustered. I am not setting foot in there again, she said. What good can come from a bunch of fuss budgets chattering away? What compassion can you expect when old women talk about the young? Huh? Oof, enough of all those reading glasses, those needles, those crochet hooks, and those whispers. Oh. Put me in front of beautiful children, kittens, and birds, and flowers. <laughs> when she spoke those words, she was over 70 years old. Our little village in Burgundy was very lucky that my father was not so good at his job. He was the local tax collector. Mm -hmm. My father was respected because he had only one leg. He had served in the Crimean War and he lost his left leg to a cannonball. He called that injury my scratch. Living in a small town in the country, I was in love with nature and animals. <laughs> in fact, my whole life, I have been close to my dogs and my cats. More on that in a moment. When I was growing up, I want to show you something. When I was growing up, I was known for my long plates of hair. Huh? More than five feet of hair. 
<laughs> it, was, uh, it was dark with reddish threads. It was almost as long as I was tall. I had to wake up a half an hour earlier than my siblings so that my mother could brush it. Then at the age of 16, I began to, um, to exchange love letters with a man from Paris, the son of an army friend of my father's, a man 14 years my senior. Love, <laughs> even confused love, cannot dispense with writing. Respect for the truth obliges me to admit that my maiden letters did not herald my career as a writer. Now, limited as they were by my shyness, my preoccupation with uh, keeping my writing proper, to, to decorate my capital G's, remember my name is Gabrielle, and the M, almost gothic, of the first line. My darling. A certain distinguished gray-blue paper seemed to me the only one worthy of my amorous and, of course, clandestine correspondence. Where to hide so I could write? Hmm? Not in the room that I had occupied since my childhood. My mother's room had a commanding view of it. Our li library was not a possibility because people from the village were always coming there to visit my father's fat Larousse dictionnaire and swarming on it like a trove of bees on honey. Now, from a romantic standpoint, uh, for the pounding of a young heart and for lies, the place I chose was a hundred times better. A longer road, midway between the train station and our little market town, a bench, almost always empty. It was my accomplice. Seated on the ground with my legs extended onto the bench that I use as a desk, I wrote, My dearest, dear one, I couldn't close my eyes for a moment last night. You were both too near and too far. Ah. That was my attempt at the obligatory lover's lie. Since the night before, I had slept very well, thank you. My cat next to my cheek. <gasps> I had nothing to say. I, as despite the love that I believed I had in my heart, I had nothing or so little to say that 17-year-old me who crept furtively to the station to put her letter into the mailbox. I did not yet know how to cover page after page laboriously, to, to stretch it out, to improvise the chronicle of a village where nothing ever happened. I wasn't fond of my love letters. I only loved the responses. The other voice of the duet. Yeah. I admired his fine writing, gladiate, obliquely ascendant, uh, that shot out aggressively and nimbly. Of this eloquent arabesque, I envied the ease, the, the fiery and personal style that kept the writing so condensed that I often had to resort to a magnifying glass to decipher it. One of his traits should have worried me. It was a sort of agoraphobia that made his writing shy away from the open spaces of the page. He made bizarre use of the margins <laughs> and the angles of the page, the flaps that glued the envelopes shut. Ooh. On these tiny triangles were massed microscopic writings. Hmm? taking refuge far from the center, rising in tears above the hypotenuse. I should have thought more about that, or at least mused about it. <laughs> we are strange creatures, so uncurious about one another at heart. My engagement to him, Henri Gauthier Villard, or Willy as the world knew him, lasted three years. When I was 20 years old, he married me. Willie took me to Paris, but I had to pay a very, very high price for the ticket. The year was 1893, the height of La Belle Époque, the beautiful era. Paris was a hurricane of parties, in, uh, salons in Art Nouveau drawing rooms that featured such luminaries as Claude Debussy and uh, Marcel Proust. We were all mixed together then, uh, artists, aristocrats, uh, nouveau riche speculators, and those ladies who are part of uh, the unique class they called the demi-monde. 
The demi-monde was the world that my novel Gigi takes place in. It's a class of women who are not born into money, but who could reach the highest levels of society by learning to use their wit and their beauty to amuse the men who possess the fortunes. That is the world that Gigi's grandmère and her aunt are training her for. I socialized with all the most celebrated women of the demi-monde then, mm? including the celebrated Caroline Otero, a statuesque actress called La Belle Otero. She earned the nickname the Siren of Suicide. So many men took their lives out of love for her. All of Paris society would retreat to Monte Carlo in the winter for its milder climate and its roulette. <laughs> I remember once, Willie and I were there with all the fashionable people at a costume ball on the Riviera. The only thing that anyone talked about at this party was feet, feet, and more feet. Oh, my feet. Oh, God, my feet are killing me. Oh, I can hardly feel my feet. Up on the balcony, I saw swirling below, swirling, glowing, swinging, trampling, a mauve and yellow nightmare, cyclamen and buttercup, Oof. the two colors that were the themes for this costume party. Oh, the tiresome and insipid pairing of the, the two pink mauve and the lifeless yellow. A bit like vomit, if you ask me. Under my anonymous smock of a Pierrot, I wandered heroically, jostled, stepped on, ah, my feet. Oh. And eventually, despite the masks and the costumes, I recognized certain um, silhouettes. A way of holding one's head, a shade of blonde, a young little devil happy to shout out abuse from under his black velvet mouth without fear of retribution. Everything was whirling, whirling. The dancers unfurled against the officials in charge of the ball. These sad little black islands, somber reefs that stagger but resist. Oh, those champions of order and morality. Let's dance! And I eagerly took into my arms a gracious mauve domino mask, a svelte, supple blonde who, unaware, steps on her train of satin and soft muslin. And we turned, we turned, carried along, squished, pushed till we reached one of those little black islands standing against the storm. Oh, surprise! <laughs> the little island reacted. He stopped us with a polite but inflexible arm, and its rough policeman's voice said to us, separate please, ladies. It's forbidden here for women to waltz with other women. Rules of decorum, you know. Rules of decorum? <laughs> we didn't know any rules unless we broke them. <sighs> In Monte Carlo, irresistibly, you slide downhill to the casino. By the end of the night in the gaming rooms, all that anxious humanity struggling, sweating, suffering, coveting, and despairing, it smelled almost like a stable. Me, I hardly ever gamble. You just don't know how to bet, the lucky Jean de Bonne insisted in an authoritarian voice. Just watch what I do. She tossed a gold louis on the number 26 and, whoop, miracle of miracles, the ball just happened to land there. I kept quiet and I admired, but my friend, the Comtesse, shrugged her shoulders and she stuck stubbornly to her system of playing inverses. She plays 13 after 31, uh, 32 after 23. But what does she play after 35? Since the last number on the roulette wheel is 36. I didn't dare to ask because I didn't know how to play. I prefer to watch so many beautiful women. <laughs> they gambled, all of them, and passionately. When they placed their bets, a mysterious purple injects their cheeks, poison injects their eyes and changes the shape of their noses. <laughs> so, that was a tiny slice of La Belle Epoque. And it was beautiful, oh, especially 
for a girl from the provinces who had only read about this life in the tabloids. But one thing that was not beautiful about that period was my marriage. Willie, oh, at first I loved every silly thing about him. His, <laughs> his pans, his paunch, the way he snubbed his nose at everything sacred. He was not the kind of man that any mother would like her daughter to marry. Maybe that's why I married him. Ah, there was, he was the kind of man who liked to parade around with a young, attractive girl under each arm. He gave me all the diseases that a husband can give a wife, including one that is more common than the common cold. Those were faults that many men have, and a few women too. But he had another fault that was possibly just as unforgivable. His family owned a printing company, so he could have books published at any cost. He used to pay writers down on their luck to write novels that he would then sign with his nickname, Willie, raunchy tales of no literary merit at all. He put his name to 50 books that he never wrote. 50! In fact, when Willie, who, who was against Captain Dreyfus and was a rabid anti-Semite, refused to sign a petition that several writers had drawn up in support of Dreyfus, one of Willie's friends joked that it was the only occasion on which he refused to sign his name to something that he had not written. When Willie's family cut him out of their business dealings, <laughs> He asked me if I would try my hand at writing a novel about a schoolgirl's love affairs. So, I filled several of those notebooks that schoolgirls use for compositions, and I showed them to Willie. He read a few pages and he shoved them in a drawer. Two years later, he was cleaning out the desk and he actually read my book. This is brilliant, he said! He published my first book, Claudine à l'école, Claudine at school, and it was a huge bestseller. <laughs> Willie knew a cash cow when he saw one. He asked me to write a sequel, and he locked me in a room each day for four hours till I finished a new chapter. There was exercise equipment in the room, that's so I could uh, keep fit. I was one of the first women to, to work out to keep my figure unheard of in the 19th century. Each book in the Claudine series was a success. Willie had me pose in a, a schoolgirl's floppy collar and sold Claudine postcards and Claudine collars, Claudine ice cream, hand lotion, cigarette papers. Everyone was mad for Claudine. Willie and I were in all the tabloids. I started a new series of risque books. This time, I insisted on signing them Colette Willie. Then, I cut off all my long hair and uh, cut my hair into a bob. Those were my small steps toward independence. I had married Willie without money. Hmm? I, if I left him, I would be forced to earn my living, which was not easy for a woman in 1906. But Willie had succeeded in making me notorious in all the tabloids. The irony is, the notoriety that he created for me allowed me to have a career on the stage. I started my life in the theater as a mime, and I left to go on tour with a group of actors. When I returned to Paris, I never moved back in with Willie. Breakups. I have written a lot about them. Should I read you one of the stories, maybe? Maybe shipwrecked on a traffic island. <laughs> oh, it's only you, Amand. Come in, don't peek. I'm wearing my putting on makeup hat. Have a seat. Not on the dog, you silly man. Hammond, a portrait painter, is one of my newest old friends. But certain uh, 
emotional accidents have strengthened our affection for one another. And we now think of each other as childhood buddies, even though he's approaching 50. 50 autumns have gilded, tanned, thinned out his long face with his knightly nose. So if this ordinary man resembles Don Quixote, that's not his fault. For three years, we have played together the game of telling our woes. As fate would have it, at the moment when my marriage was breaking up, the very young and lying Madame Hammond left the conjugal home, abandoning her husband right when he was in the middle of painting her portrait. Poor Hammond. Oh. I saw this betrayed older lover shed tears. He witnessed and sympathized with my crises of silence that had turned to revolt. He recounted unpublished anecdotes about my ex. And I, in turn, recalled some words from his crazy young wife. Oh, do you remember when? For us, those were picnics of black melancholy, which left us disgusted, exhausted, disgusted by it all, until the miraculous day we discovered together, fearfully, that we were very happy to have lost. He, his wife, me, the cause of my suffering. We didn't tell a soul. To the whole world, he continued to be that poor Armand. Sometimes we would exchange a glance like gleeful accomplices when he came and knocked at the door of my dressing room at the music hall. He hardly paints anymore. He strolls, he's happy, free, on his own. His large nose inhales the delights of life. He disappears for weeks at a time, and when he returns, he returns in a great mood, <laughs> revealing his happiness only through deep sighs. He and my dresser are the only ones allowed in my dressing room while I mold onto my face, oh, sorry, Vaseline, white face, rouge, while my scarf, which turned into a hat, makes me into a billiard ball or um, a doll without a wig, as it does this evening. Oh, it's only you, Armand. Come in. He sits down behind me, and his long silence ends up intriguing me. I turn around. Oh, Lord, what is the matter with you, Armand? <sighs> he lifts his head with the expression of a sad collie, his eyes filled with a sorrow beyond remedy. What's the matter with me? My wife is the matter. I've taken her back. You've taken her back? Whatever for you, silly man? He scratches the rug with the end of his cane as if he doesn't dare answer just yet. Because, because uh, last Saturday she was on the traffic island in the middle of the Rue Royale in front of the Madeleine. Furiously, I lift my shoulders. But that's idiotic, Amand. This is some kind of joke. It's not a joke. Look, you know how bad the traffic can be in Paris around 6 in the evening. I know, I know. Get to the point. I know I can't get to the point. Let me tell you the whole story, good God, if you want to know everything. The traffic, as I was saying, is very bad around 6 o'clock, particularly around the Madeleine. I was on my way there in a taxi, almost at the Madeleine, on the Rue Royale. It's absolute chaos there. A sticky fog, cars bumping into one another, pedestrians stuck on the sidewalk, too long and getting angry, cursing the traffic cops. And then, like crazy people, the pedestrians start to cut right into the six lanes of traffic. In short, it was your everyday riot. My taxi purred patiently by the traffic island, uh, the one with the clock, you know. Three or four mad women who were squawking on the sidewalk started to cross right at the moment when the whole mass of cars began to move forward again. And one of the women, slightly bruised by one of the cars, she, she stepped onto the little traffic island and stood there petrified right in the headlights of a limousine. It was my wife. So? So? I saw her there, but she didn't see me at all for half a minute. She had on a stupid hat, the kind she always likes. 
But underneath it, what a face. Oh, her mouth was open. She was out of breath with fear, holding her skirt with one hand and with the other a shiny fur. And pressed against her, she held a little purse, an umbrella, I don't know what else, twitching with terror, with a look like Andromeda gave the monster. It broke my heart. She stood there, her back against the gas lamp, with the expression of a shipwrecked woman who stares, glued to a reef, while the seas are rising around her. I, I don't know what happened to me. Suddenly, I yelled inwardly, you see her? You see that face of a drowning woman, that horrible look of an abandoned animal who doesn't know where to turn for help? It's your fault that she's there, weak, hunted, miserable, sinful. You can take her back. Lift her with one hand onto your island. Save her. Do it. Do it. And did you? I did. I threw open the door of the taxi. I pulled that shipwrecked woman to me. She's at my house now. She has no idea what happened. She thinks I still love her and that she took me back. So she's taking advantage of the situation. She makes decisions. She parades around, recites her speeches all over the house, in my house. And so here I am again, very, very unhappy. <laughs> Ah, yes, I made fun of my breakup with Willie in that story. But in reality, it was not so easy. I knew for a long time that, that I should leave him, but it took me years to finally make the move. When you fall in love with someone, uh, you think that person is going to be the love of your life. It's not so simple to give up that hope. And then... When you finally do leave, disappointment sinks in and uh, it's hard to wash out. My next love was a very different kind of person. An aristocrat that descended on the maternal side from King Louis XV and on the paternal side from Empress Josephine, wife of Louis Bonaparte. Wore expensive English suits, uh, hand-tailored silk shirts, uh, suede boots. Her name was Missy. She had briefly been the wife of a marquis, a marriage that ended after one night. Missy belonged to a select club of women in Paris who cross-dressed. They had their own salons, their own parties. They even had their own bistro in Montmartre with no sign out front. Meanwhile, I was making my living as a mime, performing in a three-person troupe. We were always on the road, one night in each venue. We appeared in every city in the provinces, each one <laughs> with its first-class establishment. Uh -huh. Now, I happen to know that in almost all these first-class establishments, Cursal Casino, Casino Cursal, El Dorado, Eden Concert, you will find at the bottom of a staircase that smells of cabbage, a dressing room where you can smell the latrine and the same slop pail, so small but so dirty. <laughs> the melodramas that I appeared in there were only one act in a, in a big variety show. So we often went on between the acrobats and uh, the jumping dogs. Oh, those poor dogs. I wish I could have stolen them. Oh, one night after the show, I watched the magicians packing up by the glow of the only light uh, left on the stage when the house is dark. It's called the ghost lamp. Their trained doves took their exercise like prisoners n under the roof of the theater, wheeling around and wheeling around and around, and finally coming to rest on the shoulders of the ones I called their tormentors. Because nothing is worse, is sadder than the fate of a trained animal, and especially a dove. Oh. They alighted there, cooing tenderly. Missy, my lover, would at first accompany me on these trips through the provinces. 
she would pamper me with nice hotels and fancy restaurants. Uh, once she even agreed to appear on stage with me at the Moulin Rouge. She played a male archaeologist who falls in love with a mummy. Yours truly. <laughs> I emerged from a sarcophagus, unpeel all my bandages, and turn out to be an Egyptian princess, scantily clad, of course. <laughs> he, she kisses the archaeologist passionately. Wow. When Mrs. Aristocratic Relatives got wind that she was going to perform in this scandalous production at the Moulin Rouge, they packed the house on opening night and disrupted the show by pelting us with oranges, uh, tomatoes, eggs, anything else that they could find. Well, that was the end of Mrs. Stage career. For all her English suits and uh, suede boots, Missy was really more like a mother to me than a lover. And she soon grew, tri grew tired of accompanying our performance troupe. Eventually, I only saw her uh, when I returned to Paris or sometimes at her summer house on the coast of Brittany. Beautiful. A place that inspired more than one of my books. My life with Missy became complicated when a man began to attend my performances, sitting in the front row each night. This man was the dashing Baron Henri de Juvenel, an editor and, uh, of the newspaper Le Matin, where I had started to publish articles. A man three years my junior. I ended up leaving Missy for Henri and he also left a woman, his lover. Oh, she was an excitable woman and she, she brandished a pistol at me. I had to hide out for a month till she calmed down. When Henri and I married, I became the Baroness de Juvenel. Not the most expected outcome for a scandalous vaudeville performer and writer who had been banished from every fashionable salon. Henri and I had a passionate marriage that was always on the verge of crumbling, like the crust of a wonderful pastry. At that stage in my life, I loved the drama of these constant arguments and reconciliations. By accident, we conceived a child, my daughter Colette de Juvenal, my only offspring. We called her Belle Gazou, which means beautiful chirping in the Provençal language. Hmm. Right at that time when Belgazu was born, Europe was plunged into the First World War. I covered the human side of the war for Le Matin newspaper, reporting on uh, wounded soldiers. I recounted the letters that the soldiers sent me from the front about the perseverance of nature even in the, in the face of the worst horrors of trench warfare. One young man wrote to me about a couple of starlings who fed a beakful to a squawking brood in a nest attached to a section of a ruin that was still smoking. Imagine, near the Meuse River, as night descends, at the hour when silence falls over the cannons, the machine guns, the hand grenades, imagine the voice of a nightingale singing, moved only by the approach of night, and love. And I, I wrote about the soldier who wrote about the swallows of Fleury, who warbled confidently among our troops at the thundering minute of the attack. You may say, oh, that's wonderful. Yes, yes. Yes, it's wonderful that the eyes of men have seen, recorded these things, have acquired, <laughs> with regard to tiny creatures, a consideration that will endure. So their eyes were not blinded by ca cannon fire or crushed by the approach of the darkness where so very many young bodies have gone cold forever. The astonishment, the delicacy, the poetry that appears in these soldiers' notes brings them to life. <laughs> these observations were gathered by, by new eyes, hmm? eyes open since the war and by the war, uh, eyes astounded by, uh, by a cricket in the roof thatching, or <laughs> dazzled by a lark, the dew, the dawn, 
scales fall off their eyes. In fact, won over in contemplating death by gratitude, by the respect for all living things. World War I seemed to last forever. My second husband, Henry, served as an officer and was away for long periods, some of it on the battlefield and some of it on diplomatic missions. His diplomatic work led to his political success after the war. He was elected to the Senate and he was then named France's chief delegate to the very first experiment in world government, the League of Nations. Meanwhile, a new generation of women was growing up in the period after the First World War. A generation that had more choices. Many were joining the workforce and more women were dating before marriage. Oh, oh, not to mention the fact that you could get a perm. And I was one of the first to try that technology. The French women's magazine Marie Claire asked me to write an advice column for these young women. <laughs> oh. Should I read you one of the letters I received? Okay, you've convinced me. <laughs> From Denise in despair. In May, I met a young man. At the beginning, he told me he loved me. And since I had never flirted, never known another young man, I put all my trust in him. From the start, he didn't hide that he had flirted before, but he swore that he would love only me. When he went home to visit his parents, he wrote to me a letter full of remorse and doubts. He asked my forgiveness for having made me suffer, and he promises to try to change because he's not worthy of a love as pure as mine. Then he tells me that he never liked me, as in love. He just wanted to flirt. He realizes now that he was wrong. He signed his letter, your sincere friend, Jean. In other words, there hasn't been a breakup at all. Oh, tell me, Marie Claire, do you think that love can grow from a great friendship? Answer me, please. You see, for him, I am completely different from the girls he knew before because I have a, a beautiful concept of love. It's something sacred and I will never love another besides him. He asked me to promise that I will get over my pain, but I can't. I keep having these crises of crazy despair. <laughs> Should I hope? Besides, I'm, I'm very pretty, everyone says so. But these compliments disgust me. I would prefer to be ugly and to be loved by the one that I love so much. Some girls tell me that I'm really wrong to suffer for a guy, that I'm not modern, that I do better to have fun with whoever. But this, this negative advice disheartens me. I don't go out much. I'm going to be 20 years old and I have to do all the housework myself for the family. P.S. Right now, Jean has no relationships with other girls. I think he really wants to change and be more serious. And here is my response to Denise in despair. He has recognized his mistakes hmm? and he signs his letter, your sincere friend, Jean. Can you doubt that it's all over between you? If he liked you as someone to love, he might have signed his letter, your worst enemy who adores you, Jean. Then he wrote you, I'm not worthy, and he told you his doubts. Leave all hope behind. If you were the one distant from him and he still loved you, wouldn't you, in order to end the burden of an unrequited love, oh, intolerable, wouldn't you forego this ignoble gesture of making yourself ugly in someone else's eyes. But that's what Jean is doing. He talks about friendship, a decoy, a scarecrow for young lovers that he offers as a consolation. How would he know that between a man and a woman, 
Friendship is a temperate and delicious climate hmm? where love takes refuge when it has given up all its fruits and serenely accepts and welcomes old age. Jean speaks about humility. Why not about the respect that he has for you? Huh? Such great virtues in him seem like a, a fake beard. They are insignificant next to his charming faults. Often just an ornament for his prerogative of being 20 years old, thoughtless, spontaneous, demanding, jealous. <sighs> How moving your postscript is. Jean wants to change, become serious. He doesn't see other girls. All the more reason to give this way too clever Jean time to develop his character far away from you and hope that he will see, on the contrary, other girls. Pretty, serious, hardworking. Do you fear the comparisons? In a few months, I hope that you will laugh about ever having written the words crazy despair, never, never love another. Wait. Remain in your own eyes and in the eyes of others the way you are. Refuse to have fun with whoever. It's not a pretty thing, a young woman without restraints. Besides, I'm not worried about you. You are not among those for whom pleasure can substitute for happiness. <laughs> but, as you know, the one who is giving the advice is often the one who needs it. <laughs> My relationship with Henri was not going well. He was a passionate man, and people who, with heated dispositions, often have difficulty confining their feelings to one person. Henry had difficulty confining his feelings to five people. And it was also a time of, of growing experimentation in relationships in France. <laughs> we were testing all the limits, and to test the limits, you have to go beyond them. I... I I did it myself during that marriage, so it wasn't all Henry's fault when it ended. <laughs> this was the period when I began to sign my books under the name Colette. It wasn't my full name, it was, a, it was my last name at birth, but it was all mine. When they published the first book under that name, oh, I made sure that the word Colette was in large, bold-faced type. <laughs> Soon after that, I met my third husband, Maurice Goudequet. He was also my last husband. He was a jeweler who specialized in pearls and Jewish, 17 years younger than me. Such a sweet man. <laughs> when he was an adolescent, <laughs> he used to tell his parents that he would one day marry me. We were finally introduced 20 years later at a dinner party. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we moved uh, together to the Palais Royal, that is the, the former royal palace in Paris that had been broken up into little apartments and uh, shops. Just Maurice and I, oh, and the pets. Oh, <laughs> I promise you, I would talk about my pets. I was never without a dog or a cat or or both, many. <laughs> there is no risk in spending time with a cat, you know, other than the risk that you may become richer. I, I don't know whether it's on purpose that I have sought out the companionship of felines for the last half century. I never have to look far, they, they appear right at my feet, you know. <laughs> a lost cat, a, a farm cat that hunts and is hunted, oh, it's skinny with insomnia. A bookstore cat embalmed in ink. Cats of cheese stores and butcher shops, well-fed but chilly, their, their soles squarely on the tiles. Wheezy cats of shopkeepers and uh, bloated with scraps of lung meat. <laughs> Happy despotic cats reign over me. All of you meet me as if you were not surprised and not displeased. <laughs> One day, a cat testified in my favor. 
a wandering and famished cat that threw herself at my feet, yelping against the crowd as it disgorged from the Otoy metro station. She unraveled me from the others. She recognized me. Meow, meow. Finally, what took you so long? I was at the end of my rope. Where's your home? Go ahead, I'm right behind you. She followed me, so sure of me that my heart was beating hard. <sighs> at first, my home frightened her because I was not alone. You know? But she got used to it. In the end, she stayed there four years till her accidental death. <laughs> I have come to the conclusion that there is no such thing as an ordinary cat. No. Every cat I have encountered has provided me with an example of a, a personal attribute. It deserves better. This animal to whom the Creator gave the largest eyes, the, the softest fur, um, uh, delicate ear, moving delicate nostrils, a pause without peer, and the curved claw <coughs> borrowed from the rose bush. <gasps> I have hardly ever stopped singing the praises of cats. Our perfect companions never have fewer than four feet. Ah, well, back to Maurice, my favorite two-legged pet. Those early years with Maurice were the most tranquil of my adult life. But they were not tranquil economically or politically. Oh, no, no, no. First came the Great Depression. <laughs> Maurice's pearl business went under. I started a beauty salon and a skincare and uh, perfume business. I have never, never had as much respect for womankind, as much admiration as I had looking at a woman close up as when I held uh, reflected in a blue metallic light her face without its secrets, you know, rich in expression, agile under its wrinkles, uh, or new and refreshed by having left behind for one moment its, its extraneous color. Oh, the struggle. But it's the struggle that keeps you young. I did my best. No, oh, but you. The women who were my clients, you helped me so much. When some of you whispered to me your true age, I was dazzled. I remember one woman who threw herself into my little laboratory as if storming a barricade. She had an acid wit, down to earth, superb. Get to work, get to work, she yelled. I've got a difficult sale. It's about looking 30 today, and I mean all day. Mm. One would not believe that so many feminine faces in Paris remain to a ripe age just as God created them. But when the dangerous hour comes, <laughs> a sort of uh, panic sets in, you know? A desire not just to endure, but to be born. It's the season of the bitter late spring of the heart with its power to move mountains. And then, in the middle of it all, came the Second World War. The Nazis occupied Paris, and it wasn't long before they started rounding up Jews. We knew that it might be just a matter of time before they came for Maurice. As it turned out, he was among the first 1,000 people to be arrested. The Gestapo came for him at dawn, before dawn. We, we heard the pounding on the door, and Maurice said to me, not to cry in front of the soldiers, not to give them the satisfaction. I managed to control my emotions when the soldiers took Maurice uh, from me. <laughs> but only until I saw them drive away. At the detention camp near Paris, where the Germans held Maurice, the jailers fed the, the prisoners only a bowl of stringy soup and a hunk of bread each day. The Nazis only rarely uh, permitted a food parcel to get through, and it, it broke my heart to receive the, the notes on crumpled paper smuggled from Maurice, pleading for bread, jam, and honey. I knew his next stop would not be just a detention camp. Meanwhile, I went to work, personally visiting everyone I knew who might be able to help Maurice. Through a connection, I found out that the German ambassador's wife was French. Her name was Suzanne Abetz, and she had read 
some of my books. I arranged to meet her. I was terrified, not knowing if she would be sympathetic or if I would instead draw more unwanted attention to Maurice. Hmm. Madame Abetz, uh, it's very kind of you to see me. Oh, not at all. Uh, Madame, I don't know if you are aware that my husband is being held in a detention camp. Oh, our mutual friend has informed me of your difficulties since I know that your husband is a, ch is a man. Well, they haven't all been, you know, but yes, yes, he is. I have also heard through our friend that uh, you might be acquainted with my writings. Oh, very well acquainted. I have several favorites among your novels. Oh, I am so flattered to hear that, madame. I wonder if you would like me to autograph your copies. Perhaps I could even send you signed editions of my two most recent books. <gasps> would you really? Oh, absolutely. And. Um, do you think there is a chance that you might speak to your husband about my uh, difficulties? I will see what I can do. Apparently, she did speak to her husband because she was able to obtain Maurice's release. When Maurice came home, after two months in detention, he was 18 pounds dinner. He returned with an empty suitcase. He had left his clothes for the other detainees, but <coughs> precious few of them survived. We were lucky. We managed to stay under the radar for the rest of the occupation. No writer has ever gotten more in exchange for a, <laughs> a few signed books. <laughs> Curiously, it was under the occupation that I wrote my most light-hearted novel, <laughs> Gigi. Maybe those dark days forced us to think of happier times and la belle époque. I had first gotten the idea for Gigi, whoa, 15 years earlier, <laughs> when Maurice and I were motoring from Paris to the south of France. We stopped on the way at a little hotel owned by these two sisters who had been part of the demi-monde before they bought into this property. We were the only guests in the whole hotel, and we spent the evening with the proprietors, drinking some of the best bottles which they brought out from the cellar, including, oh, one of my favorites, Chateau d'Iquem, with its beautiful, deep gold color. The two ladies who were our hosts, they began to open up to us. Huh? I filled their glasses again. And they told us about their niece who had been raised to be a courtesan, but had recently made a surprising and romantic match. As soon as I heard it, I knew it was a good story. But uh, true stories are often, they take the longest to, to develop into novels. You first have to allow the story to soften into a plot, you know, and for the people to form into characters. The tale has to cross the border, as it were, into fiction. Gigi was uh, originally a novella and then a play. When the English version of the play was scheduled to open in New York, we had no idea who could play the lead. Uh, I was staying in uh, Monte Carlo at a hotel with Maurice at the same time, and we saw a young, uh, uh, unknown, uh, very beautiful actress in the lobby who was there working on a French film. I took one look at her, and I said to Maurice, oh, that's our Gigi! The name of that actress was uh, Audrey Hepburn. Mm. Not long after I published Gigi, I was elected to the Académie Goncourt the official panel that awards the prize for the best novel of the year in French. The rules of the Academy were that anyone could become a member, except Jews, women, and poets, of course. I guess they, they made an exception in my case. <laughs> there is even talk that I might have a state funeral when I die. <laughs> a state funeral? No French woman has ever had a state funeral. <gasps> oh. 
should I wear? <laughs> now my reveries take me back to those summers in Brittany. Hmm? I once wrote about the landscape near that house. A light rain lasting a few hours of the night had sprayed the sage, varnished the privet, the motionless leaves of the magnolia. Without crushing it, the rain had studded with pearls the protective gauze that enveloped the nest of caterpillars in a pine tree. The wind left the sea in peace, but sung under the doors in a weak and tempting voice, heavy with memories of the years gone by, spoke in muffled whispers of roasted chestnuts and ripe apples. I love that past, you know, but I also love the present. I am not ashamed of what I have had, and I am not sorry that I no longer have it. I have had a marvelous life. I just wish I had known that sooner. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Ah. Uh, before we go, I would like to acknowledge and thank and introduce my collaborator on this piece and the translator and writer of much of what you heard tonight, Zach Rogo. <laughs> Do you have to say anything? Should I say anything? I think that Zach will be signing books uh, in the back, and um, we thank you very much for being here. If you happen to catch us or catch him and give us any feedback that you have, this is a work in progress, and we do welcome all of your, uh, your reactions and your input. Thank you so much. Good night. Amen. Mm -hmm.